I ask you to turn to John 14 with me, if you would, if you have a hard copy Bible. I'll be reading, starting in verse 15, to the end of the chapter in just a bit. But before we do that, I want to remind you, we've been looking together for a few weeks now at the vision that Jesus himself has for who his church ought to be. And we had to start with an agreement. We want what Jesus wants. Amen? Because he's in charge. <laughs> he bought the church with his own blood. He's done everything for her to make her who she's meant to be. And so we really not only are obligated to him, but honestly, we just love him. And because of that love, we want him to have what he wants. So that's really our premise. Our whole goal together right now as a church body on this focus is to say, Lord Jesus, we want to all agree on what you want so that we can all give you what you want. Is that fair to say? Can we, are we on the same page for that? If we all want that together, oh, watch out. Because remember, the reason that Jesus wants his church to be a certain way is because that church vision he has that we'll be looking at for a while, it is the exact representation of who he is. And if we can show the world who he is really, accurately, so many people will be drawn to him. So many people will be attracted by him. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he? And the, most, of the, most of the folks that, that do not just fall on their face before Jesus in love and admiration is one of two things. They either just love their sin too much to give it up, or they've been given a really bad picture of him. They don't even know who it is they're rejecting. Now, the people that just love their sin too much, we'll just keep showing them love and showing them why he's so much better than their sin. But that other group, the other group that just doesn't know what they're missing, we need to be that to them so they can see it. So they can fall deeply, madly in love with this man who is so in love with us. Anywho, all that said, we're going to be looking together today, and this passage is going to be our, our leaping board for that, at what you see on the screen. I know this sounds like garbled, you know, theological language, but I'm sure you can notice that the root word of that word Trinitarian is what? Trinity. What I want to talk about today, and oh, this is so good. I'm just praying I do it justice because this changes everything if we can grasp this. What I want to look at today, and this text is going to kind of give us a really good glimpse of that, is if you think on, ponder, and, and really revel in who God is within his own self, Father, Son, and Spirit, if we can actually get a grip on what that's about, that is actually the template that's the model for what our life is supposed to be together. Oh, man, it's awesome. Anywho, enough of that intro. Let's get to the Word of Jesus, and then we're going to th reflect on it together. Uh, before I read, though, we need to go to the Father in prayer. Oh, Father, we just so long to see everything the way you do, to have vision, to have wisdom, to have the fullest picture so that we can live in that. Lord, we want to be free of the enemy's fog, of his lies, of his half-truths. We, we just want the truth for everything that it is. So I pray that as we read and meditate on the Word, that your Holy Spirit will be poured out to partner with us to do the greater work. Enable us and empower us to do what we can't do ourselves so that we can be changed, really changed, to be like Jesus together. And I ask it in his wonderful name the name that we now bear, and ask it with my brothers and sisters. Amen. All right, I'll be reading for you starting in verse 15. By the way, I'm reading the NIV. The reason we project it, one reason is, if you have a different version, that's fine. Good, good for that. But sometimes reading a different thing than you're hearing is confusing. So we want to make sure if, if it helps you that you can read the same thing you're hearing. Starting in verse 15. If you love me, Keep my commands. Dang, we could talk about that for a while, but I move on. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you. How long? Mm. I hope when you read the Scriptures, you just take a minute to take in some of these words. Dang. Can you imagine if he said to be with you for a six-month lease or something? Like, you got six months, make it count. No, what does he say? To be with you. Forever, the spirit of truth, 
The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be what? Oh, man. Do you realize the presence and the power of God actually dwells inside the bodies of Christ's people? You grasp that, that changes the whole thing too, doesn't it? Wow, man. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Did you hear that? This is for his whole church. It it really is so tragic and it's so unthinkable that there are dying churches. And I've heard that phrase, and that is an accurate phrase a lot of times. But the reason that's so tragic and so unnecessary is what he just said. There's no dying Jesus anymore, is there? (laughs) He's the resurrected, immortal, incorruptible king. And if he says, because I live, you live, that should be a forever thing as well. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Now we're starting to sense that Trinitarian community language. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. I want to read that again. Whoever has my commands and what? Sometimes we wish he would have left it at the first one. Whoever has my commands loves me. Because it's it's much easier to to passively just receive it, to hear it, not just let... Let pastor talk for 40 minutes a week and just receive the commands of Jesus. <laughs> I, wish, I wish that proved that I loved him. No, what he said is, whoever has my commands and keeps them. Just like he said, as I read to you earlier, whoever hears these words of mine and lives them or practices them, puts them into practice. I keep interrupting Jesus. Sorry, back to it. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I too will love them and show myself to them. Oh, what a promise. Has, has he ever revealed himself to you? Has he showed himself to you? He promised that. You can take him up on his promises. Then Judas, not the one you're thinking of, right? That's, that's what John seems to be saying. No, not that one. Not Judas Iscariot. Boo, hiss. The other Judas. He said, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us? And not to the world? That's a really good question. I mean, if you are who we're thinking you are, everybody needs you. (laughs) Will you please notice his answer? Because he seems to not have heard the question. (laughs) When he first read his answer, you're like, did you miss Judas' question? He says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Okay, you said that. But here's, he always answers better than your question. Have you noticed that? He always knows what the real question is. So he says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them. We will come to them and make our home with them. Oh. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I've spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Oh, listen to this. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Now remember, he's saying this right before Jesus is arrested, right before they lose their master, right before they watch him die, and he's still telling them, now don't you be afraid, don't you, don't you be troubled. You heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, he keeps talking about that. It must really matter to him. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father. Listen to this, this is a shocker for some folks. Listen to what Jesus said. Why should they be glad he's going back to the Father? For the Father is greater than I? Huh. Talking about the Trinity, that's an interesting statement. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. 
I will, say, I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. Who's the prince of this world, by the way? Satan. And he's coming through Judas, the betrayer. He has no hold over me. But he comes so that the world may... Oh, I think he's finally answering the question. <laughs> Remember the question? It's easy to forget the question because it seems like he ignored it. But here's, here's where he's answering the question. He comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. Did you notice that when Jesus began that section, I, I, we jumped right in the middle of something he was saying, but right in the, at the beginning of that section, Jesus said, here's the litmus test for if you love me. And what did he say? How, do you, how can you demonstrate or show that you love Jesus? He said, if you obey my commands. Notice what he says about himself at the end. He said, I'm proving I love my Father by obeying his commands. Now, all the way through that section, it's obviously not a section on the Trinity, but all the way through that section, did you see the interplay between the Father God, Jesus his Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Advocate? Did you see how he speaks of them seamlessly as if they're all doing separate things, playing separate functions. In fact, he goes so far as to say the Father's greater than I am, which for people who believe in the Trinity, that's kind of a weird thought. I thought they're all equal. I thought they're all the same. Now today, I'm not going to try to unravel the mysteries of the Trinity for you. It is too laugh that I would, you know, get all that settled here. Actually, that's not even my point. My point is this. As we talk about what it means to be the church, what I want to understand together is that if we can begin, even begin to grasp who Father, Son, and Spirit were, have been, are, and always will be together in community with each other, we will actually be halfway there when it comes to understanding everything the Scriptures say about who we're meant to be together. So let me start here. When I first got here, and this was a year and a half ago already, what? We began in the book of Genesis, chapter 1. We began talking about the, the vision God had when he created everything. And remember, one of the things he had in mind for his creation, particularly humans, but all of his creation, was that it be a creation of community. Do you remember that? And in fact, when he, when he saw Adam, little old Adam, that he created himself, fashioned out of dirt, and he, he breathed his life into him. God's Spirit brought life into this being, and he became a living being. And he had Adam down there, and there was no suitable helper, is the language. Now, I know it's really easy for the ladies to take offense of that when you hear the word helper, because it makes it sound like servant or something. Just remember that word helper is used of God elsewhere, so it in no way indicates inferiority. What does that mean? That means that he, God gave Adam too big a job to do by himself, and there was no animal life or plant life on earth that could help him get it done, okay? And so you don't have a suitable partner in the work I want you to do. So do you remember the first thing God does? He brings all the animals by Adam. Do you remember this detail? This is wild. Adam, who's been given lordship over the earth, as God's kind of viceroy, he, he has all the land animals go by, all the birds go by, and Adam has the privilege, the authority to name them. That's pretty big. They're pretty good. It'll be a long day. Do you remember at the end of that process, what did God say? No, no, no. no suitable helper. Nothing. Just, I mean, monkeys are great. Chimpanzees are cool, but they're, they just, they're not going to do it. Dogs, fantastic. Not good enough. So remember, he puts Adam out, anesthesia. He takes a piece of his side, weird, and creates a person out of it. And it's a different kind of person, remember? Different kind of person. Human, human just like Adam, but not just like Adam. Different. Creates a woman. And then, what's the, one of the first things he says to these two human beings? His first command to them is what? Be fruitful and multiply. And he's talking about family. Family is the first and original community. And as a family grows, so does community. And then this part of the family leaves and starts a new community. That's, community is really what God's always had in mind for humans, including with himself. Because remember, in the third chapter, when Adam and Eve got busted for their sin, 
the reason God was there talking with them about it is he came to walk with them in the cool of the day. God intended to have community with them, and he wanted them to have community with each other. Community is a big deal to God, and it, one reason that's so important to realize is God had community before he even created these pe- people. He didn't create them because he's lonely. And he also created angels. Did you know that? They have wills of their own. They have minds of their own. And they have volitional beings. And he wants them in his community too. And what I want to begin with is this. Listen, if you don't understand the graciousness of God did not begin at the cross, the graciousness of God began when he decided to create beings to open up his community to them. Because Father, Son, and Spirit, let me tell you, if, if anyone can satisfy anyone, the Father can satisfy the Son, the Son can satisfy the Spirit, they can all satisfy each other. Yet something in the heart of God wasn't content. He wanted to open up this community, this unbelievably good and satisfying community of mutual love, mutual uh, admiration and honor, and he said, we, we need to, to let other people in on this. It's too good to keep to ourselves. So what he does is he creates angels and he creates humans. And he says, come on in. Open up the gates of community and let them in. Let them take part in this unbelievably good sharing together. Now, the the story would have been really awesome if, if the humans would have just accepted that. And if all the angels had just accepted that. Oh! When we get to chapter 3, I want to punch something. Because we lost it. It was there. We had it. Is the fruit really worth that? And it wasn't the fruit, was it? It was what the fruit offered. You'll know things. Pride, selfishness, blah, blah, blah. That always destroys community. And bammo, did it destroy it real quick there. Now, here's the thing. God, and we already know this stuff, so I'm just going to quickly say this, but God was not content to watch this offer of community just be shattered and be done. He didn't say, ah, heck with it. I I offered. You don't want it. Fine. Remember, these beings that he made in his own image that bear his image, his likeness, he said, no, that's not good enough. I got to get them back. They don't deserve it. That stinking serpent doesn't deserve anything. But, you know, it's not about what anyone deserves. It's about, I want them back. They need me, and I want them. If you don't understand, the grace of God goes way before the cross, way before anything else. Just the decision to have us in his universe was grace because when he offered us a place in his universe, he offered us a place in his community. And why should we have that? Why should should the door of God's house where the community of God waits to embrace me, why should that be available to me? I can't even figure out how to be in perfect relationships with my wife and kids. Why why would he want to introduce a mess like that into his community? I don't know. He's so nice. He's so patient. He's willing to deal with my own mess, my own confusion about how to deal with folks. And he says, "I I will deal with that in time. But for now, I want you. Your perfection, I'll work on that with you. But for now, it's you that I want. Right? Oh, so good. Now, we've talked about this. Humans, angels, a lot of them, they refused it. They said, we want something else. We want our own way, so we lost out on it. So then here comes Jesus. Jesus comes announcing the message. Repent for what? The kingdom of heavens or the kingdom of God has come near. Do you realize what that really that message really is? The message of salvation, we call it. The message of eternal life. Do you realize all of that is just different words for this? Now is available to you in a new and a fresh way what I wanted for you at the beginning. I want you to enter the Trinitarian community. I want to open up the gates again that you shut. I want to open up the gates again to your life with us. That you cannot have on your own. So when you think about the Father, Son, and the Spirit living together, maybe you never have, by the way. Maybe you've been taught that they're all one person. And they just have three different faces they show. That's actually not the case. And biblically, that's not really presented ever anyway. In fact, when, just to give you case in point, when, when Jesus talks in this last discussion at the end of John, and it starts in chapter 14, as he talks about the Father and the Spirit, you never get the sense that he's talking about himself, ever. That'd be weird. 
In fact, do you remember what he said? I have to leave so the Father can send the Spirit. How do you talk about yourself like that unless you're like schizophrenic or something? No, there are three beings who are our God. I know, that's the mystery of the Trinity. We'll work through that as we go. But listen, this is what I want you to know. As Father, Son, and Spirit live together and always have and always will, how do you, how do you see them interacting? A few, few examples from the story of Jesus. <laughs> oh. When Jesus was in mortal flesh and blood, do you remember why he came? Why did Jesus come in mortal flesh and blood? Whose idea was that? For God so loved the world, he, now when we say the word God there, we're talking about the Father, so let's just say it that way. The Father so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, his only begotten Son. Some people think, and this was taught all the way through the Middle Ages by some people, some people think God was really mad and couldn't wait to smash all these sinners. Jesus stepped up in his compassionate heart and tugged on Father's sleeve and said, Oh, Father, let me give it one try. Don't smash them just yet. You know, like God's mad and Jesus is nice or something. No. It was always the Father's idea to rescue these sinners who shut the door on community with them. And Father said to Son, we got to do this. Son said, okay. Spirit said, I'm in. The conspiracy to save us, Father, Son, and Spirit all together. So when Son, Jesus, comes, what was his attitude towards Father? How would you, how would you describe it? One word. There's no one right answer. One word. What's one word that describes Jesus' attitude towards Father? Well, he said it here. Obedient, submissive, loving, humble. Every time he talked about Father, you could just hear it in his voice. He adores the Father. There are times I read Jesus the way Jesus talks about Father, and I start to well up because, oh, for my children to think this way of me. And you picture Jesus in the garden. Come on, this is not just emotional heartstring pulling. This is reality that we've got to live in, everybody. When Jesus is in the garden, knowing that Father, His Father who loves Him and is pleased with Him, is calling Him to do the most unthinkably horrible thing there could ever be done to somebody, to go through that. And Jesus doesn't want to. Do you remember? That's another sign they're not the same person. To have conflicting wills of that magnitude, right? Two, two people. But listen, what, when he said, here's what I want, Father. I can see what you want, Father. What was his conclusion? Who had to win that in Jesus' mind? Whose will had to be followed in that moment to Jesus? Not my will. Yours. Oh, my goodness. If that doesn't speak of, of Jesus' love to the Father. This wasn't about don't eat the candy bar. Don't, you know, parents, don't you wish your kids would always have that moment? Here's what I want. Here's what Dad wants. Not my will. Your was to be done, Father. Right, parents? Come on. If every time your, your child faced that decision, they said your will, not mine, their life would be so much better. Our lives would be so much better. Jesus proved his allegiance, his loyalty, his affection. Oh, to his Father every time. Now, how about the Spirit? When you, when you read Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures, what you find out is the Spirit is never about himself. He's always there to bring honor to Jesus. He's always here to echo what Jesus told us. He's always the presence of our Master. He, he, he's almost, he almost purposefully puts himself in the back seat because he's trying to bring honor to the Son. And the son puts himself in the backseat to bring honor to the father. And guess what the father's doing the whole time? Bragging on his boy. This is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. And then he says it later. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Did you know he said that? When Jesus was transfigured, shown to be glorious. The father repeats himself on the first two parts and then he changes it at the end. Instead of saying, um, with him I'm well pleased. He says, listen to him. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Those three apostles are like, yes, sir. Uh, but listen, everything Father, Son, and do are for each other. Now, do you ever imagine Father, Son, or Spirit bickering? Do you? When you think about it? If you, if you were to, and we don't have many of those, but if you were to interact a conversation between Father, Son, and Spirit, do you ever hear a nasty attitude? Slamming doors, cold shoulders, 
No. You say, well, they're God. Of course they don't have any of that. But here, here's the, here's the thing. Here's why this is so exciting. I'm not just trying to talk theological stuff and send you out into a world where you need more practical training. Listen, this is as practical as it gets. If you're made in God's image, it got corrupted. Jesus came and said, here, here's the solution. I'm going to remake you to be a new humanity so you can be like me. Here's my Holy Spirit. Do you realize that now, as people who live in the Holy Spirit's power, we can actually become the image of God we are always meant to be. As frail as humans are, when filled with the Holy Spirit, what frailty can get in the way? This is why we, we never need to speak to each other in the community as if, as if strife and arguing and gossiping and bickering and cold shouldering and unforgiveness is just the way it is. It's just how people are. And we should say to each other, but not us people. That's not who we are anymore. We've been welcomed into a community where that stuff is bizarre. That stuff is ick. You would never conceive of that in the community of Father, Son, and Spirit. So how in the world are we comfortable with it in the community that has been absorbed into them? You're, fo- you're children of the Father. Amen? You're not excited about that? You're children of God. Amen? And you are disciples, and you are one with Christ. He said that here. We're in him. He's in us. Is this exciting to you? Jesus, master of heaven and earth? You're one with him? And the Holy Spirit actually fills your physical being and unites himself to your spirit. Do you see the oneness you have individually with God, Father, Son, and Spirit, is manifestly bigger when the community of those united to God is there. And that is exactly why everything you read in the Scriptures about how to treat each other looks like how the Father, Son, and Spirit treat each other. If you ever wonder, is this fitting for the church body, ask yourself this, would the Father, Son, or Spirit do this to each other? The answer is no. Stop it. It doesn't belong. We belong to His kingdom now. Okay, I'm got to get to some good things here because the Word of God has to speak. Okay. One of the most powerful things I ever discovered that changed the game for me. I want to ask you to turn to 2 Peter with me. 2 Peter chapter 1. Listen to what Peter says here. To all saints, because he's writing to saints in all different places. He's not just writing to one church one place. He, and I'm starting in the middle of a thought, okay? So he's talking about God's glory and goodness. And he says, through these, God's glory and goodness, he has given us his very great and precious promises. Now, if you don't know the precious and great promises of God, please find them out. They are the source of hope and life for us. Why? So that through the precious promises of God, you may, do you see that next part? You together may participate in what? Have you ever read that or thought about that? Little old us, we're only human. We're always going to be sinners. I hear this language within the church to, talking to each other as if, I don't know, it makes us feel better or something. But we just talk about each other. We're just, we're just always sinners, going to be sinners. Oh, well, what can you do? At least Jesus died for us. I see the bumper sticker that says Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. That's about all you can say about us Christians. We're just forgiven. Bigger wretch as anyone else in the world, but at least we got it covered. Do you realize if what Peter wrote is true, all of that is rubbish? Every bit of it. Not to say that if you're not perfect, I know you can easily go the other way. And if you're not perfect, you're not in the body. No, 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 no. But listen to what he said. We get to participate in the divine, what? That means character. That means viewpoint. That means how we treat people, how we view God. All of that. We get to have a a share in that because God, remember, God in His divine community, Trinitarian community, He opened up the door and said, come on, come on. You can have this. I'm going to put this in you. That's what He did when He poured the Holy Spirit in you. He gave you his, his, His own self so that you could have His nature now. Oh, Now, the only reason we can have a part in his divine nature is that we've escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. That's, that's the part of it a lot of us 
really aren't convinced that we can have that. We just think that the corruption in the world is just going to be a part of us till we die. So hurry up, Jesus, come back so I can do the right thing finally. No. Right now, you get to participate in the divine nature because right now you can escape that corruption. This is the gospel, everybody. Oh, I love this. Now, in the, in the Trinitarian community, and this is like the punchline, basically, three words you can always use to describe them. They have a unity, they have fellowship, and they have community. Those are really similar. Let's break it down. First, though, let's read this. In John 17, Jesus said, I, he's praying to Father, I have given them, his disciples, the glory that you gave me, that they may be one. How one does he want them to be? Do you see it? How one should his disciples be? As we, the Father and Son, are one. I want them to be one as we are one. Do you ever read in the Bible something that just sounds too good to be true? Like, come on. Seems a little exaggerated. Could human beings in this world, in this flesh, ever have a unity like Father and Son have? Unless Jesus is just flapping his gums. Isn't that possible? If he says, I want them to have my glory so they can have our unity, it has to be an option, right? And he says this, I in them and you in me. Now, if this is really weird. This is the Trinitarian mystery. Okay, if Father fills up Jesus, which he did, and Jesus fills up us, what do we have? We have Father and Son through the Spirit. We are a part of the Trinitarian reality now that they may be brought to what kind of unity? I need to push some people on this. Do you honestly believe that we can have a complete unity? Complete. I struggle believing that, but I have to if I'm going to call myself a disciple of Jesus. I just say, Jesus, you're right. Please help me picture that. (laughs) Because I've had enough church experiences to know I don't really see that. So the problem isn't in Jesus' expectations. The problem is in somewhere in us, and that's okay. Now listen, this is one of the good things that we get to do as disciples. When we look at the mirror of what we're meant to be, and then we look at what we really are, we're going to find out we don't match up. Does that bother anybody? Well, it should, but I mean, it shouldn't distress us. Here's why. As disciples, what is our whole life about now? Training under Jesus to become like him. Get this, if we as a church body see something in ourselves, which I'm hoping these packets that I'm giving you will help us do, if we see something in ourselves that is falling short of his vision, what ought we to do? There's two main things. Oh, there it is. That's the ultimate one. First thing is mourn that. That's okay to mourn that. Just be sad that's true. And it's not about pointing fingers and throwing things at each other, and if you would get your act together, you know, none of that. We just, we mourn. But we don't stay there. Because if we stayed in the mourning phase, we have just said that there's no, there's no hope. Boo-hoo. That's that. We're sad that this is the condition, but then we move towards this. Repent. And that's change. Change our minds. By the way, brothers and sisters, if you ever wonder the, the method to my madness, why these packets, why are we talking about the church for so long, this is exactly it. As the Word shapes our minds, it inevitably leads His church to repent, and repentance inevitably leads to obedience, and obedience leads to this. And I want so much for us to have this, because every need you have would be met. Every need. Read how the earliest church in in Jerusalem, read it in Acts 2 and 4. Read how the church, when they lived the way the Spirit told them to live, they needed nothing. Every need was filled. Emotional needs handled it. Spiritual needs got it. Physical needs done. People are selling their property to feed each other. Can you imagine selling a car because a brother or sister needs something? They were doing that. Because they were living in the Trinitarian community. And I, I just keep saying, Lord, is that something we can really have? He said, yep. But, but Lord, he said, look, do you think that the people living in Jerusalem were like way ahead of you when I started doing this in them. The reason I was able to do this in them is because they yielded to me. That's the only difference, he says, right? Oh, so great. I love you, okay? I love you deeply, but it's like this compared to God's love for you. God 
through his son Jesus, is not calling us to have this Trinitarian life together just to put more demands on you and to make you feel worse about yourself because we're not there yet. The reason he wants this for you, partly, is because he knows this is the only way your needs are going to be fully met. There are people in our church right now that do not have all their needs fully met. And a lot of people would look at the pastor or the elders and say, well, go do it. And all I could do is look back at you helplessly and say, I can't. Look at the number of people in this room. If it was your job to do that for everybody, how would you do? Especially when most people aren't even telling you what they need. Are you with me? How do you do that? And the thing is, he never designed a pastor or the elders to do that for everybody. Do you know what he designed? You are here for everybody here. Everybody's here for everybody. That's the Trinitarian experience. It's not the Father sitting on the throne watching everybody do everything. We're all in this for each other. That's why if we live this the way Jesus said, we get to meet everyone's needs. Everyone is satisfied. Everybody. And there's a lot of you that can't even imagine that because you've never experienced it yet. I'm with you. But that's what faith means, isn't it? That's what faith means. I trust him with something I cannot presently conceive of, but it's got to be true. Master said so. How about this? Fellowship. We proclaim to you, this is in 1 John, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus talks about if... if uh, you believe in me, and if you follow and obey me, then my Father will come to you, I'll come to you, and we'll share a meal with you. That's fellowship. It's not actually a criticism of the church necessarily to say that when we talk about fellowship, we usually think of food. Have you heard that joke? But we talk about fellowship, like, where's the food? Now, a part of that, okay, it's true. You shouldn't have to eat every time you have fellowship. But there's a reason that that is the way it is. The, the meal, the table spread with food where people sit around, not in front of a TV, but around a table looking at each other, communicating with each other, that is one of the sweetest pictures of fellowship we have. It's supposed to be that way. That's why he keeps talking about meals, right? Do you know what fellowship means, though? I'm going to have to stop here, darn it. I got halfway through. Okay, you know what fellowship means? Fellow. What is that? Like me. Right? Oh, my fellow Americans. What am I saying? I'm on your one. My fellow Romans, I'm on your one. My fellow disciples. So fellow means common, like me. We have this in common. Ship just means state of being. So fellowship means we're in the state of being in common with each other. We have commonality. Listen to what he just said, John the Apostle. He said, we want to have fellowship with you. We want to have something in common with you. And, and our commonality, do you get what he's saying there? We have something in common with whom? What do you say at the end? With the Father? You have something in common with God? And with His Son, Jesus? Here's what we have in common. We share in the divine nature. We share in their mission. We share in their compassionate heart. We share not just with them, but guess what? We're supposed to have everything in common together. I think, well... So we have to have a common taste in music? No. Common taste in dessert? No. What's common is everything that the Father and Son and Spirit care about. We should have that in common with each other. That's why we don't have to bicker in the church. We don't have to. Because one of two things is going to happen. We're all going to love the Word so much that we study it, look at it, talk about it together, and the Word brings us together because it's telling us what's up. Sometimes the Word stays vague on things. So what about that? Well, here's the beauty. Just like Jesus in the garden, when we have a different will from the other person, we just learn to submit that will. Just submit the will. And are there a lot of things in our church life that the Bible is not crystal clear on? What do you think? How long should the pastor preach? Well, we all got ideas on that, don't we? Especially this morning, maybe. <laughs> the Bible didn't give that. If it did, some of you would call me on that. Anyway, but... If the Bible's vague on something, we're going to disagree. Now what? We talk about the goals we have and say, what's the best way to get there? And then we submit. If I don't win out, that's all right. I want God's purpose to win out. That's all. 
See, everything that we're going to encounter as a church body, Jesus has the best way to handle it. So we can avoid all the nonsense and just stick to being one with the Father, one with the Son, one in the Spirit, one with each other. Now, the last thing I'm going to say is this, because this is going to kind of hopefully get us ready for next time we talk in this setting. If you would, as you fill out our packets, as you just think on what, hopefully, as you think later on what I've said today, what I want you to picture is this. What would life look like in our community? There's just this here at First Church of Christ. We can get to other communities joining us later. But just think on this. Within our own community, what would it look like? What would be the same? What would be different if we had a life together like Father, Son, and Spirit share? What would that look like? How could that work with dozens of people with different wills and different ideas and different experiences. How does it work? Now, if you have trouble imagining it, that's okay. Part of the process. But keep chipping away at it. Keep forcing your brain to imagine this person being that way with this person, this group being that way with this group. And what I can promise you is this. What the Holy Spirit will do is start to give you a sense of hope that that's actually available. And as soon as you believe that God could do that in us, He's going to start. Do you believe that? Because remember what Jesus said as he healed folks all the time. What did he say? What was his natural response whenever he healed a person? Your faith has healed you. I don't want to oversimplify that statement, but here's a big part of that. As soon as you trust me that I can do it, watch me go. And until you trust me to do it, I won't. Ooh. If we trust him to do this in our midst so the world can see Jesus as he really is, watch him. And people will be all around be going, what is happening over there? People in the church body, what is happening in here? And we'll be like, thank you. He's happening. Because we are his people, purchased by the blood of his son, filled with his Holy Spirit, presence, and power, called to join him on his mission. And that is exactly why we are all, before anything in our lives, disciples, Jesus Christ.